Hello everyone, today we're continuing our deep dive of Richard Dawkins and Yan Wong's book, The Ancestor's Tale. In this episode, we're going to discuss the swim bladder. So, let's jump right in. In the previous tale, we discussed the morphological diversity of all ray-finned fish. Today, we're moving to a specific clade of ray-finned fish called the isosiformes. Remember from the last episode that most ray-finned fish are teleosts, which also includes the isosiformes. These fish are sister to the salmoniformes, an order named, of course, for salmon, but which also includes char, graylings, and a few other lesser-known fish. Isosiformes are native to algae-choked, slow-moving rivers and streams in Europe and North America, and the order is split into two extant families, Umbridae and Isosidae. For the former, Umbra, one of the mud minnows, is the only extant genus. Interestingly, Umbridae was named by Charles Lucien Bonaparte, nephew of French Emperor Napoleon Bonaparte. Isosidae is named for the pike genus Isox, although the family also contains Novumbra and Dahlia, both of which are considered mud minnows. The pike gets the tail because of how it hunts. Pikes hang motionless in the water, drifting silently towards their prey. Once the pike is close enough, it thrusts forward and catches prey with its razor-sharp teeth. The pike is able to hang still in the water without sinking or floating because of an organ we've met a few times already, the swim bladder. Remember that the swim bladder is a modified lung. Lungs evolved first prior to the common ancestor of all bony fish being ventrally attached to the esophagus. However, in ray-finned fish, one lung sac was lost and the connection with the esophagus was mostly lost to make the swim bladder. I say mostly because for some fish, the swim bladder is still attached to the esophagus via a small connection called the pneumatic duct. Fish with this configuration, the physostomus swim bladder, can still gulp air to supplement their swim bladder. Such fish include the paddlefish, sturgeons, gars, and bowfins, as well as basally derived teleosts like tarpon, eels, arowana, arapaima, elephant nose fish, old world knife fish, new world knife fish, herrings, anchovies, sardines, carp, and catfish. More derived fish, collected in the clade Euteleostei, have a physoclistus swim bladder. Their mechanism of air filling is a bit more complicated. When physoclistus fish are juveniles, they have the pneumatic duct, just like their non uteliost cousins, but this connection disappears as the fish age. I know we've said this a thousand times, but evolution can't go back to the drawing board when things change. Changes must be built atop existing structures, so sometimes the path of least resistance for evolving a structure is to start building a thing while truncating its later development. The same thing happens in our development concerning the pharyngeal arteries. When we start developing, we have six pharyngeal arteries, however three of them simply stop developing and disappear. So, how does air enter the physoclistus swim bladder? Between the swim bladder and the circulatory system is an organ called the gas gland. The gas gland is associated with a very densely packed system of arteries and veins called the retae mirabilae. These arteries and veins have so much contact between them that ions, gases, and heat can be exchanged directly between them. The gas gland secretes lactic acid into the bloodstream, and this produces both carbon dioxide and oxygen. Carbon dioxide is produced when lactic acid comes into contact with the bicarbonate buffer system that maintains our blood pH. In us, we can just exhale the resultant carbon dioxide, but physoclistus fish can allow their carbon dioxide to partially diffuse into the gas gland and then the swim bladder. As for oxygen, the deposition of an acid into the bloodstream, lowering the pH, causes hemoglobin to lose its oxygen molecules. This is called the root effect after biologist R.W. Root. And just like carbon dioxide, oxygen can partially diffuse into the swim bladder. Given that background, let's return to the pike. 
Pikes are physoclistous fish, and their ability to hang motionless is due to having neutral buoyancy. The swim bladder is said to function like a Cartesian diver, also known as a Cartesian devil, named after French mathematician René Descartes. The idea is that contracting and expanding the swim bladder causes the fish to sink down or float upward, respectively. Think about it this way. Take a straw and fold it in half, glue the two open ends together, and put the straw straight down into a capped bottle of water. Some amount of atmosphere will be stuck in the straw, causing it to float. When you squeeze the sides of the bottle, the straw sinks, but when you stop squeezing, the straw floats. The reason is that the straw displaces less water when the bottle is squeezed because the pressure forces more water into the straw, thereby making the straw weigh more, so it sinks. When this pressure is released, the straw displaces more water, allowing it to float. This demonstrates both Archimedes' principle and the ideal gas law. Archimedes' principle states that the upward buoyant force exerted on an object immersed in a fluid is equal to the weight of the fluid that the object displaces. Allegedly, Archimedes jumped out of his bath and ran naked down the street shouting Eureka, which means I have found it in ancient Greek, upon his formulation of this idea. As for the ideal gas law, this states that for gases, pressure and volume are inversely related, and clearly, the straw's gas bubble gets smaller when pressure is applied to the water. However, swim bladders don't really work like this. There's nothing in principle preventing them from doing so. Fish could just use their muscles to squeeze or relax the swim bladder. But in our experiment, the amount of gas in the straw remains the same. In fish, as we've seen, the amount of gas fluctuates. Gas can be gulped directly from the atmosphere or diffused into the swim bladder by chemical reactions in the blood. In fact, the Cartesian diver effect actually causes problems for fish. As a fish descends, more pressure is exerted on the gas-filled swim bladder, causing it to contract and increasing the rate at which the fish sinks. It's also the case that gas absorption increases with greater pressure, so the swim bladder may quickly lose the gas molecules as well. In the opposite direction, as the fish rises, less pressure is exerted, and the fish rises faster, and more gas may be released from the bloodstream. In other words, the hydrostatic pressure produced by the swim bladder is very delicate. Some fish have dispensed with a swim bladder altogether, like the hawkfish family Cerididae and the Atlantic mackerel Scomber scombrus. Many deep sea fish, like the barbel dragonfish family Stomiidae, have lost their swim bladders too, but other deep sea fish have filled their swim bladder with incompressible oils for buoyancy. We saw this previously in coelacanths, but the lanternfish family Mictophidae has independently evolved this feature. We also see something similar in chondrichthians, the cartilaginous fish like sharks and rays, which have large livers filled with fat. Some deep sea fish have retained their swim bladder but reinforced the walls to prevent air from escaping. They may do this with overlapping guanine and hypoxanthine crystals, for instance. Deep sea fish like the eel, Cynaphobranchus, and Halosaurus have ten times as many of these crystals in their swim bladder walls as shallow water conger eels. Rat tail fish of the family Macroeuridae instead pack their wall with fats. Finally, some fish have adapted their swim bladder as a sound organ. In the clade Ostariophyce, which includes the minnows, carp, loaches, tetras, piranhas, knifefish, and catfish, the swim bladder is connected to the inner ear by four bones called the Weberian ossicles. This structure serves to amplify sound waves that would otherwise be almost imperceptible to the fish. A final note about swim bladders, or rather the original lungs of the early bony fish, is the importance this organ may have had in the survival of our ancestors during one of the greatest mass extinctions in Earth's history. We have mentioned the episodic late Devonian extinctions before in the lungfish's tale. These were characterized by collapses of reef systems, which even in modern times also form the base of many diverse ecosystems. Most research points to widespread anoxia as one of the main drivers behind these collapses, but exactly what led to these conditions is still debated. As mentioned before, this may have something to do with the first appearance of large woody plants, which caused nutrient runoff that fueled toxic algae blooms, or it could have been changes in global sea levels caused by climate change, or these two factors may have been interrelated. 
Either way, if anoxia was one of the main drivers of extinctions, then it's perhaps unsurprising to see that most vertebrates that are currently alive are descended from fish that had lungs. Even today, when there is little oxygen dissolved in water, many fish will simply resort to gulping air. On the other hand, during the Devonian, the most abundant groups of vertebrates were heavily armored fish, like the jawless ostracoderms and the jawed placoderms. These probably didn't have lungs, and their heavy armor also places on them a high metabolic, and in turn oxygen, demand in several ways. They probably needed to swim constantly to keep themselves from dropping to the ocean floor, and building the mineral armor also requires a lot of metabolic energy. This likely meant that heavily armored fish were very vulnerable to low oxygen conditions. Of course, not every living vertebrate has lungs or is descended from lunged ancestors. We still have some chondrichthians like the sharks and modern jawless fish, like hagfish, still with us, which never possessed lungs. But they also don't have any heavy armor nor an ossified internal skeleton like the bony fish. Perhaps that's why they managed to survive, by not having to pay the energetic cost of building and carrying heavily ossified bone or armor, while the bony fish with lungs could afford to pay the cost for their bony skeletons. So that's the pike's tail. Ray finned fish have fashioned their swim bladder from pre existing lungs, and from there, ray finned fish have continued to modify their swim bladder or lose it entirely. We are fortunate to have such an immense diversity of ray finned fish so that we may observe the many evolutionary routes they have taken over millennia. Thanks for watching, and we'll see you all next time.